All right, guys, Murph's here. And today, by viewer request, we're gonna discuss guns that I regret buying. So, I have a pretty expansive collection. I've been buying guns for years, and I definitely have a, a list of guns that I kinda wish I had bought, or perhaps my opinions have changed on over time. So with that, I've got a collection of guns laid out here today, but not all the guns that we're gonna talk about are present. So with that, I'm pretty much gonna list everything from like least regret to most regret. Starting off with this Glock 23 Gen 4 chambered in 40 Smith & Wesson. Now, longtime viewers of the channel know that I am a Glock fanboy, so they might be surprised to find out that the first option right off the bat is a Glock 23. Let me explain. So, when I was a young man, I decided to finally get what would wind up being my best concealed carry option and my first Glock. I was, I've was i always been a really big fan of Glocks, been a fan of Glocks ever since I was a kid, and I finally decided I was gonna add one to the collection. I was a much younger man at this point. So I went into the gun shop, and I'd already been debating with myself over a Glock 19 or a Glock 23 for years, and had decided that I wanted to go with a Glock 23 because at the time, I was really big into the 40 Smith & Wesson, and decided that the slight diminishing of capacity was perfectly acceptable for the perceived capabilities I got out of the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge. Now, the guy behind the counter at the gun shop kind of argued with, with me on this. He was really convinced that I should get a Glock 19 because it was already kind of a trendy, popular carry option at that point. I insisted on the Glock 23. He did up the paperwork. I was living in Florida at the time, and I had to wait 72 hours in order to be able to pick up my handgun. Now, that ran across a weekend and then into my work week, so I wound up coming back the next weekend to pick up my handgun. When the guy pulled out the gun that had been set aside for me, he pulled out a Glock 19 not a Glock 23. I addressed this with that fella and he double checked the paperwork and saw that it was in fact the serial number that is on this particular handgun and handed me the correct Glock handgun. Now, as time had gone on, there have been times where I wish I had bought a Glock 19 instead of a Glock 23. And a lot of it comes down to this handgun can be a little snappy and kind of a handful. Now I have developed as a shooter to where I am back at the point where I do not currently regret this handgun purchase. This handgun performs just fine. I'm able to get a lot of capability out of it. However, the one thing that has always been in the back of my mind is the fact that I can shoot a Glock 19 better and more easily. Now, and of course, 40 Smith & Wesson ammunition is now also much more expensive than it used to be. So that's another thing that sometimes makes me wish that I got a Glock 19 instead. But I have no designs of getting rid of this handgun. I do have some designs to maybe make this into a project gun to make it a little bit more viable to me, but this is going nowhere and it's a fleeting regret at best. Now that brings us to our next gun, which longtime viewers of the channel might be surprised to see. This is my Spikes Tactical Lower on a with a CBC upper that I refer to as my go-to right this was actually an early reviewed video on the channel, which if you're interested in this review, go ahead and check the link in the description. I'll have it posted there. First off, guys, I actually really like this rifle. But I don't like this rifle because of certain features of it. I like this rifle pretty much because of the upper. I love the length of this handguard. I love the weight of this rifle. And I also love the barrel profile and its capabilities. All of these are the things that I love about this gun. What I don't love about this gun, and I mentioned this in the review as well, is this lower. This is the Spikes Tactical Crusader Lower. Guys, I'm not a big fan of kind of trendy aesthetics and all that kind of stuff. So I don't like garish colors. I don't like prints, you know, be it American flag or leopard skin or whatever type of, you know, finishes and stuff like that you guys like to put on your guns. I like solid neutral colors, FDE, OD, black, maybe gray, all that kind of stuff. And I'm also not a really big fan of trendy kind of gimmicky markings and stuff like that. Like, you know, oh, a Crusader shield and, you know, God wills it on the selector and all that kind of stuff. Just, it's not, it's not really my vibe. I bought this gun because I like the upper. I regret this gun because of the lower. And I have considered selling off the lower and just keeping the upper and it's something that goes back and forth through my mind every once in a while, especially when, you know, the gun fund's a little low and I know I'm gonna need to generate some cash. So, that is why this gun is on the list. Now, another regret might be a little bit surprising to people because this gun has also been previously reviewed on the channel. And this is my Ruger Mini 14 Tactical Chambered in 556. 
Now, somebody not too long ago was arguing with me on the channel as to whether or not this was a Ruger Mini 14 Tactical, citing that it does not have the flash hider on the front. However, I bought this new in box, so I don't, I don't know what it is that we're arguing about at this point. Now, what is my issue with this gun? Because I actually gave this, you know, a pretty decent review. My issue is entirely the stock. I bought this gun as my first tactical rifle. And it kind of shows in that regard. I grew up with the Mini 14, so when I saw a tactical Mini 14, I was like, yeah, that's what I need in my life. In all actuality, this ATI stock kind of sucks. Like, great, it's side folding, and I am a really big fan of side folding stocks. However, the stock itself is not necessarily that high of quality. There's a lot of screws you got to take you got to take out in order to be able to disassemble the gun. I'm not a big fan of that. And this is another rifle that every once in a while I consider selling. However, what I think the more likely outcome is at this point is that I'm going to wind up stripping this action out of the stock and dropping it into a stock with more classic Mini 14 lines. Maybe not necessarily a wood stock, but still even a synthetic stock with the same shape as the wood stock because that is the, the Mini 14 I think of whenever I think of back to what I was shooting as a kid. And then also with that, with the synthetic stock, I could still mount tactical accessories on it and have a tactical rifle just to have it be a little bit more of like a, a crossover between what is kind of a sporting rifle and what is a tactical rifle at that point. So there's this. And, and also something else to keep in mind, guys, this was a very important like developmental step on my understanding of like the tactical practical use of firearms. So I don't regret this gun in the sense of, oh, it was like a terrible investment or something along those lines. I regret this gun because it shows a lot of my learning curve and maybe that's a little uncomfortable to have to face every once in a while. But nonetheless, very important. Now, next up on this list, again, might be a little bit of a surprise to people. And that is this HK USP 45 Compact. Chambered M45 ACP. Let's see if I can do this without looking like an idiot. I have not yet done a full review on this pistol, but I did do a competition review where I took this gun straight out of the box and straight into a competition with no prior training with it, which I'll throw the link to this in the description to that video. Now, I like the HK USP. That's not what I'm saying right now. I'm not saying that I don't like HK and I don't like the USP line. I have a lot of 90s nostalgia for the HK USP, 90s and early 2000s nostalgia for the HK USP. My issue is entirely with the 45 Compact. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Because like a 45 full size, I wouldn't have these issues. First off, magazines, super expensive. Second off, holsters, super difficult to find. Third off, practical shooting of this handgun. So the issue with 45 compacts of pretty much any variety is that you wind up with all of your features kind of squished into this very small area and a gun that's really not that small to begin with. So 45 caliber handguns already are kind of large. So you're taking a kind of large gun and you're trying to shrink it down and you wind up compressing a lot of your features into a very small surface area. A surface area that winds up getting ridden by my thumb on my thumbs forward grip with the slide release and then I never get last shot hold open, which pretty much means that every mag change is preceded by me tap rack and attempting to go bang but having the slide back and then conducting my reload. That's, you know, obligatory how it should look. Is what if I have a malfunction? What if there's something going on with the gun that isn't just an empty chamber? I still have to perform that check. So I did take this handgun into that competition, and I've also since then uh, co-instructed a course, a handgun course with this particular handgun, and that was kind of the last straw for me. Now, I'm not going to sell this gun prior to tinkering with it a little bit more. I'm going to put some more rounds through it. I'm going to try to work around it a little bit. Also, maybe get it sent off to HK to get its trigger issue addressed. And then, after I finally get a review up for it, I'll probably sell it at that point. So, it's probably a while away. There's probably still a lot more work that I'm going to do with this gun before I let it go. Now we're into the portion of the video of guns that I have sold. 
Starting off with my Ruger LC9S. Now, I bought this handgun when single stack uh, subcompact 9mm were kind of the trend. The Glock 43, Smith & Wesson M&P Shield were out. And I decided that both the Glock 43 and the M&P Shield were too large. Not when there was an LC9S. Now, the LC9S was the striker-fired version of the Ruger LC9. All the same features, just had a striker-fired trigger instead of an internal hammer. And at first, I loved the gun. It was very slim. It was very small. You had like seven rounds of 9mm on board, all that kind of stuff. Everything was great. Had good sights, much better than the later EC9S, which would be a cheaper version of the LC9S, which is kind of hard to comprehend because the LC9S was already pretty cheap. And those sights would be molded into the slide itself, and they would be like nubs for sights. They were absolutely horrific. Whereas the LC9S had actually, actually really good contrasting sights on it. So why did you get rid of it? Well, because it was so slim, it moved around in my grip a lot, and this caused two issues. One, it threw off my shot groups because under recoil, it kind of wiggled around, and as I manipulated the trigger and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of additional play in my hand to allow the gun to kind of wiggle. And then also, it made the gun feel more snappy in the hand. Now, what ultimately did it in was that I had those issues, and then also it started malfunctioning a lot. So at that point, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of over this, and I got rid of it. I wound up trading it for a Smith & Wesson Model 5906, which I then traded for my Smith & Wesson Model 642. Now, to some extent, guys, the accuracy aspect of it, it moving around in my hand a lot. When you're shooting small handguns like that, that's going to happen to you regardless. So in hindsight, did I need to get rid of it? Well, still yes, because it was not being reliable and I have a very low threshold of unreliable, of, you know, accepting a lack of reliability in defensive type options. All right, so what is the number one most regretted pistol that I've ever, or most regretted gun that I've ever bought? That would be a Citadel 1911 Compact chambered in 45 ACP. This was the very first handgun I ever bought. I was super excited about it. I handled it at a gun show. It had all of these super high-end features for a compact 1911. It had an extended beaver tail grip, or beaver tail safety. It had an extended thumb safety. It had a lowered and flared ejection port. It had a crowned muzzle. It had a full-length guide rod. You know, on and on and on. It had all of these really fantastic features on a gun that was in the $450 to $480 price range. It just, it blew my mind. It was so amazing. It was super heavy, which at the time I associated with like high quality construction. And now I would associate with just being a brick. And I used to joke like, well, you know, if I don't, if I run out of ammunition, I'll just throw the gun and, you know, kill him that way or something along those lines. Like just, you know, something kind of what people say whenever it is that they're carrying a brick. In hindsight, that should have been a warning sign to me. But again, we're talking about steps in my own evolution. So, I got that gun. I finally got it out to the range, and it was a Jam-O-Matic. I thought perhaps it was something to do with the break-in period, so I wound up running 500 rounds through it, which is really expensive when it's 45 ACP, by the way. Even back then, 45 ACP was still more expensive than 9mm. And... It was still a jam matic at the end of that. So at that point, I wound up looking for opportunities to get rid of it, and I wound up trading it to a friend for a Glock 27, and then I wound up trading that Glock 27 for my current Ruger Security 6. All right, guys. I think that pretty much covers the guns that I have most regretted buying. I hope you guys found this interesting, and I would love to know in the comments section, what gun do you most regret buying and why? All right, guys, pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. Have a good day.